comes to apostasy, it's based on similarity and similarity between uh, people. So shared values, like being the same religion, because historically Islam was not uh, based on race. Uh, Islam did not have ethnic and racial conflict like you'd see in other empires, like the Roman Empire and so forth, mm -hmm. because it wasn't racial or ethnic. It was on the basis of uh, similar uh, religion. So this is a source of order and cohesion as well. And those who um, uh, basically leave the religion, they pose a major threat to that social order and that social cohesion. And this is a very violent act to leave uh, the religion because all of society is based, that, that cohesion and order, there's not a top-down structure that is imposing like you see in the West. Uh, and in, men, in the modern nation state, you have a uh, society that has this logic of um, cohesion because of shared similarity in religion. Uh, we have the same values and all of these um, fam like family structure, um, family relations, social structure, communal structure and so forth at every level depends on a shared religious belief. So if someone opts out of that, it threatens uh, that order. And so there is a clear um, harm to people in life. Obviously, we can talk about the afterlife and the harm that's caused by someone leaving Islam, but we're just making points that a non-Muslim would agree with. There is tangible harm to society when uh, you have defectors. And every society punishes defectors often with death and liberal society is no different modern liberal society is no different in punishing defectors and we see this to this day but definitely throughout the colonial period that the liberal colonizers when they take over certain territories they punish uh, with death with imprisonment anyone who speaks out against the liberal secular order and the colonial powers. We saw this throughout North Africa, in the subcontinent. Millions of Muslims were killed because of their opposition, their ideological opposition to liberalism. Okay, so they defected from the colonial power. The liberal powers justified that, look, we are trying to maintain our power, therefore we have to kill these defectors because if Muslims start speaking against uh, us, the colonizer, then uh, they're going to, uh, we're the minority, they're going to band together and they're going to overthrow us, they're going to uh, fight jihad against us and expel us. So we cannot allow any dissension uh, and defection. We have to punish uh, things like disrespect to the French symbols or the British symbols, disrespect to British values or French values or Dutch values. We have to punish that very severely. And liberal thinkers justified that. And they said that, such figures like John Stuart Mill, that the savages, you have to limit their freedom of speech. You have to limit them because you're trying to civilize them. You're trying to bring them to a state of uh, civilization. So you have to limit their speech very severely in order to do that. Then once the liberal order is, is established, uh, then suddenly, uh, and there's no threat, to the liberal order, then suddenly you're tolerant of free speech. When I, for example, speak against the U.S. government, like someone might say, no one in a, in a secular country is killed for denouncing the government. No one is killed in, in uh, the West for denouncing Donald Trump or any of these uh, regimes or presidents. See how much freedom of speech we have? See, see how much tolerance we have? Well, this is like comparing apples and oranges because you can't really compare that to apostasy. In these Western states, Donald Trump is not threatened if I call him an idiot. If I, if I, Donald Trump and the U.S. regime is not threatened by me speaking out against them. If I were to reach a position and more and more people were uh, thinking about uh, going against the government, then the government would crack down. Then suddenly free speech is no longer allowed. So it's very convenient of the West and of liberal regimes that when they are their power is not secure, they do not allow free speech. In fact, they kill people, they kill defectors. And then once they've entrenched power, then okay, then you, they'll allow uh, things that don't actually threaten their power. Whereas in Islam, apostasy is a major threat to the individual 
the individual's happiness, his family's happiness, his community's happiness. So there is a practical benefit to deterring it, and you deter it with uh, severe punishment and capital punishment. So that that's the argument. Okay. Um, to, to finalize this point, I think we should be we should be wrapping up soon. Um, <clears throat> We haven't clarified the policy fully. So um, you, you have basically given it. You have basically uh, justified how policy should how policy serves for the preservation of of, of Islamic society and how uh, how uh, defecting from Islamic society harms society, harms people, harms relationships, harms the relationship between me and my parents, for example. You have given examples of how uh, in Western society um, thought that goes uh, strictly against the system has been punished in history, although we don't see that uh, that opposing. I mean, for example, you are you argue for a very strict Islamic uh, Islamic points and an Islamic government, Islamic uh, traditionalism, whereas you live in America. That that should be like that should be the by that logic that should be the most. Uh, opposing the, the most problematic opinion, the most problematic political position that you can have, yet you are not in any, in any trouble, and you will most likely not ever be in any trouble throughout the rest of your life, although you are in, uh, in America, which is a liberal society, and you argue completely against it and completely for Islamic law, which nobody wants and nobody likes, and, and society is ruled by, by, well, by, by, by the majority of what society wants. So I still don't get how you could possibly give these examples or go out of these examples and justify why Islam would impose people to forcibly stay loyal to its system even when people don't want to stay loyal, even when people want to go out of it. How, how, how is that justified? How, how would God want that? How is that good for society? I mean, I'm, I'd just be re reiterating the points. Like, um, so, uh, Islam has reasons for its uh, values and the laws and the punishments and, and and all of islamic ethics and the claim is that uh, that system is going to maximize human happiness like you make this argument and I, i've cited all kinds of reasons and studies so on that basis that it does that anything that will undermine the that system of family that system of uh, community uh, if you start saying that no, the Islamic uh, Islam's teaching on sexuality is actually false, and we have to start practicing adultery and fornication and homosexuality. If someone comes and does that, uh, that causes you know massive amounts of damage and harm because of uh, families start breaking down, right? Families well, start breaking let's, down. Let's, it causes let's conflict. Let's come to Let's come to converting to Christianity, for example. Someone wants to, or an entire family wants to convert to Christianity from Islam, or wants to convert to, wants to convert to Buddhism from Islam, for example. They're not, they're not advocating for, uh, for sexual perversion or deviance or anything like that. They simply want to convert to Christianity and live a peaceful life, or convert to Buddhism and live a very peaceful life. Well, what is wrong with that? Well, there's many other aspects to um, social cohesion that we haven't really talked about. So. Uh, one uh, part of social cohesion is similarity in dress, similarity in practice, like coming to a central place of worship and bowing together in the same ritual actually has uh, a great deal of um, effect on people's willingness to be altruistic, to help each other, to support each other, to not harm each other. Uh, that practice by itself, which is a part of Islam, like congregational prayer. So all of society doing that, uh, dressing us in a certain way, speaking a certain way, your language, right? The language that you use to communicate. Like Muslims, even though they speak all the languages of the world, we have shared vocabulary in Arabic because Arabic is the language of revelation. So that creates bonds and a uh, type of connection and unity that makes the Muslim community strong and it protects the Muslim community from external threats because you have this kind of in-group uh, sense of loyalty and that protects that community and that society from external threats. If someone within that community starts saying, no, I'm not Muslim anymore, it disrupts all of that cohesion and it also makes the group less unified, there's less in-group unity, and ma that makes it more vulnerable to existential threats from the outside. So these are all practical reasons that, I, that I'm giving you. I mean, the, the world that we live in today is 
um, based on complete coercion and force. If you, there's an interesting quote from a um, Yale legal scholar, and he says that every law is an opportunity for violence. Every law that is legislated is an opportunity for violence. Why? Because if someone violates the law, like give the parking ticket example, if you get a parking ticket, you don't pay it, then the, go the government can put a lien on your house, uh, foreclose your house, and kick you out. If you refuse to leave your property, the sheriff can come and arrest you. If you refuse arrest, then he is licensed to shoot you and kill you. To use deadly force and so every law has this threat of deadly force and western countries have the most laws of any civilization in history like you could even if you spent your whole life trying to study um, western law you couldn't cover every subfield of the legal system so this is constant control and imposition and violence and this is why you can have people uh, who are completely different in their religion who are able to live peacefully with each other because the state is controlling everything and making sure that violence doesn't erupt. But if you don't have that uh, Leviathan state, that, that kind of imposition dictating every moment of your life, surveilling every moment of your life as currently exists, in the West and in the world as a whole, then what other kinds of ways can you maintain social order? And in those circumstances, um, you uh, having similarity in religious belief is very important for maintaining that.